It's been since Father's Day since I've been on the stage. Whole lot has changed, even got a year in age. I'm 39, y'all. <laughs> Moved from Brownsburg to Westfield, my family was sent. Went from owning a home to now we paying rent. My new house, it ain't that big. Nothing special about my crib. I thank God for transportation, but nothing special about my whip. Used to think that all of this would determine all my worth till I read Matthew 6, 19. Do not store your treasures on earth. So I follow exactly what the scripture said and made that verse my motto. Then 6, 21 says, wherever your treasure is, your heart is also. And though I like it, I don't love it. When it comes to my Jesus, I don't put nothing above him. So I'm passing through like I was up in a parade. See the world, what hating and take it. This is how I wave. Wave it to the demons and sins and temptation. Telling them bye, because you can't take my salvation. Therefore, I don't lose heart, even though I'm wasting away. See, inside I'm being renewed day by day. You think that I live here? James, you got me bent. I got a building from God in heaven. This here is just my tent. Give it up for God, y'all. Oh, it's been a minute. Hey, give it up for the online community as well. What's up, Nathan? What's up, Brittany? What's up, Holly? What's up, Chris? I am so thankful to be back here. As you can, you might be able to tell, I got a little raspiness in my voice. I don't know if it's because at worship rehearsal I was screaming, or if it's because at boxing I was screaming, or if it's because I'm screaming, or if it's my allergies. I don't know, but I got a little bit of a strain on my voice. Please bear with me. It's not going to change what God's about to do this morning. I do this thing where I say, good morning, Mercy Road. You say, good morning, Rashad. It has nothing to do with you glorifying me or anything. I just want to make sure that the energy's in the room. You've left everything at the door, and you're ready for the Word of God. Amen? Now, you have some people here who are very childish. They call me radish. Don't ask. We don't know. Don't join those heathens. Stay right here in the room with me, okay? Good morning, Mercy Road. Good morning, Rashad. See, I feel like your energy's down because my voice is not good. And somebody said radish anyway, so we're going to do it one more time. Good morning, Mercy Road. Good morning, Rashad. Ah, uh, yeah, let's get busy. So, hey, I'm doing the last week of Unshakable Kingdom. And what Josh did last week with that Hebrews 11 was so amazing. I want to jump back to Hebrews 11.1 because that's kind of what births chapter 12, which is what we're going to be in. So in Hebrews 11.1, it says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. The assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Assurance, that word, there's the same word used in Hebrews 1.3 when it talks about how God is spirit, so you can't see spirit. So Jesus is the exact representation. Jesus is the assurance or the manifestation of what you can't see when you go to look for God. If you want to see God, if God took a selfie, right? Like if God was like, let me take a selfie, right? What pops out is Jesus. And so this verse is saying that your faith, your faith is going to be the selfie that pops out of what you actually believe in your heart. Answer me this. If we took a selfie of what you believe, what would pop out? If we took a selfie of what you place all of your hope and your dreams and your satisfaction and your desires on, what would pop out? Would it be Jesus or would it be your house or your car or your job or your children or your marriage? What would pop out? And whatever pops out is that thing unshakable. The Bible says it's by faith that men of old were approved by God. See, they lived a life with their lives, not just their lips. So the selfie that they took when they said they believed God for what he said, it showed in their actions. And Josh went through and told us about how people were actually sawn in two for what they believed. People moved and went to a place where they didn't know what was there. Like all these things were just proof of faith. And so at the end of all of that, verse, uh, chapter 12 says this, chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, so basically, if you read all of chapter 11, therefore, because of chapter 11, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. I got three points for you this morning. And it's all in a response to what faith is. It's all looking at you and asking you, like, what, what are you going to do with this conviction of what faith actually is? Our first point is going to be this, our challenge. We have to respond to chapter 11, to what we saw in chapter 11. We have to respond to it with our challenge. And our challenge is to mimic the movements of the martyrs. 
I've been gone since Father's Day, so y'all going to get a whole lot of alliteration today, okay? Y'all just got to deal with that. That's just where I'm at right now, right? To mimic the movements of the martyrs, right here in verse 1. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses, the word witness is where we get our Greek word martyr from, those who die for what they believe. Now, a lot of people jump to this verse and say, see, right there, that's how I know grandma's watching over me up in heaven. Now, I'm not going to say that that's not true, but I'm going to say this is not the verse you want to pull that from. Because grandma is in heaven. He, she's probably got her eyes on God, right? She, she's in the presence of the Father, right? I don't know if she's looking at your little knucklehead. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. But what this is, so what does it mean? What does it mean that we're surrounded by witnesses in this text? Well, look at this. Martyrs, witnesses, testimonies, testifiers, right? Those who lived an example. We are surrounded by examples, to follow. You see, you're in the race of faith. You have a race that is set in front of you. And there's a specific way you have to move to be able to finish that race. Now, your race and my race may look completely different, but the movement to advance in that race is the same movement. When we had the uh, Holy Hoedown back in May, anybody come to the Holy Hoedown? Look there. Yeah, look at that. Look at all those hands. Go. Other, uh, some of y'all like, Holy Hoedown, what church am I in? Like, right? Ugh. Right? No, but look at this. So, so what we believe here is that if you have a desire, if you have something that is precious to you, that God is giving you a God-given desire, and there's an area that it can meet the needs of those who are outside the church or even inside the church, when you put those two things together, they're called an outpost. And whatever that is for you, we affirm you in that, and we get behind you. And so some of us like to dance, right? And we like music, and we just like to get together. So we had a holy hold down. People came from all over. They came in, and it was all put on by my homegirl, Gen Z. Everybody say, Gen Z. Gen Z, that's her name, Gen Z. And Gen Z is like a professional, a professional, professional dancer, like holy hold down dance, line dancer. Thank you. See, she helped me all right there. Now check this out. Keep it in, keep it in. Check it out. And so she did like the boot scoop boogie and like the poncho. See, I know, I know the Cupid shuffle. I know the wobble. But like when she started doing all this, I didn't know what was going on. But she was in a sense our martyr that we had to watch the movements of the martyr so we knew how to dance. So I would play the country song that she told me to play. And they doing a boot scoop boogie. James, they doing a pontoon and all this. But then me, being the kind of guy I am, I switched it up and throw some hip-hop on, right? Just to throw everybody off. I'm like, we're going to switch it up and culture everybody. You know what I'm saying? And what ended up happening was a couple people stopped and looked at me like, that ain't the song for the boot scoop boogie. I'm like, why'd you stop dancing? If you just keep doing the moves, it don't matter the song. The moves haven't changed, right? And so in the same way, we have to look at those who were dancing in the Old Testament from Hebrews 11. I mean, you have to stop just taking Josh's word for it, just taking my word for it, and open up your Bible and read it for yourself. you got to read the Old Testament. Go back and read about Noah. Read about Abraham. Read about Jacob and see how they ran their race. Your race may be different, but it's the exact same movement. It's the exact same movements. There was something they believed in here that they lived out in their life. What was it? What was it that they held on to that they were willing to get rid of anything and everything that they were holding on to? Go read about it. Because I can say a whole bunch of stuff up here. That doesn't make me right. But this is the word of God. Go read it for yourself. Don't take my word. Don't take Josh's word. I'm not saying I don't trust Josh, but <laughs> he's not here today. <laughs> Excuse me. So look at this. So how did they run their race? It says, let us also, also meaning there's something else that we're also doing that they did. Let us also lay aside every encumbrance. That word means every weight. It says encumbrance and sin. You see that? Let us lay aside every weight and sin. That means these weights that he's asking you to lay aside aren't necessarily sin. Think about that. See, I love living out here in Hamilton County now. I've been out here for about a month now. Really enjoy that. I'm in the Westfield area, countryside. If anybody's in the countryside, woo woo. Okay, you're close, close enough, all right? <laughs> but, 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 but check this out, check this out. Let me show you what it looks like to lay aside weight, even when it's not sinful. See, living in Brownsburg is okay. I was living in Brownsburg and I felt called to Mercy Road. Six months in, me and my wife had to lay aside a weight. See, I've been in Brownsburg since I was 14. It's everything I know. I'm comfortable there. I got family there. I got, you know, friends. I got, like, a lot of established roots there. And it's not that it was a sinful thing, but I was called to you. I was called to you. 
I was called to people in Mercy Road. I was called to Hamilton County. I was called to this area specifically. And so although I was walking my race, I couldn't run my race when I got to run home to Brownsburg every single day or run from Brownsburg every single day instead of being in the midst of you. I didn't have enough time to be with you anymore because I had to take an hour trip home and an hour trip to get here. Brownsburg is not a bad place to live. Living there and pastoring here is not a bad thing. But for the race set before me, I had to lay down that weight so that I could run my race that he set before me. What weights are you holding on to? Think about this. Because I've, 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 since I've been out here, I've noticed that Hamilton County is a bubble. Like you don't have to leave Hamilton County to have anything you want. Everything is right here. You don't have to leave the bubble, right? Right? So what kind of comfort does that create for you that is hindering you from running your race? See, it hits home now. I want you to think about this because these are not bad things. It's not bad to have the nice house or the nice car. It's not bad at all to have the good job. None of that is bad. But when it starts to hinder you from running your race, it is now weight. It is weight. And what decisions are you making because you're trying to hold on to that weight instead of letting it go so you can run your race? So you must lay aside every weight, anything that would hold you back, anything that would hold you down. You have to let it go. It says the weight and the sin, anything that misses the mark of God. Then it says for us to to run the race with endurance. Endurance is different than long-suffering. Long-suffering is what you have with people. People get on your nerves. You got to be long-suffering, right? (laughs) Endurance is staying up and under a situation. It's about circumstances and situations that you stay in for the sake of running the race. And then it says to race I mean, excuse me, to run the race set before you. In other words, some of y'all need to stop looking at everybody else and their mom and how they run in their race and judging them and look at your own race. Some of y'all over there like, mm, look at that. Looks like they stumbled over that hurdle. Why are you looking at them over there in that hurdle? And you ain't moved because you're too busy looking. Oh, am I somebody's backyard? Uh-oh. They don't like me no more. You're supposed to run the race set before you. When I read the examples of those in the past, they don't got the same race that I have, but they move the same way. Like, they, they show me how to move through my race. I lay down things. I lay down the sin. I lay down the, 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 the good things that aren't God. And, it, and it's everything, right? Like, check this out. I say it like this all the time. Just because it's good doesn't mean it's God. The extra O means you doing too much. You see that? That extra O means you're doing too much. It's good, and people will praise you for it and all that, but now you're trying to hold on to a perception or a reputation or whatever, and therefore, it's weight now. It's a burden now. Things that are meant to be something that you're joyful in and you're rejoicing in, you can't do it because you're trying to keep up some image that's just weight. Lay it down. Aren't you tired? I'm tired. I am. So, let me give you just another quick example. This is a bad example. My wife ain't going to like this one. I woke up this morning a little late. I had a couple options on how I could get here on time. I had to lay down the weight so I couldn't iron my shirt. I just threw it in the, <laughs> threw it in the dryer, threw it on, and just got here, right? It would have, like, really pushed me back where I couldn't do a whole bunch of stuff if I would have ironed it. Now, ironing my shirt's a good thing, but I ain't worried about what I look like in front of you. I'm just going to be honest with you, right? Because that's a perception and a weight that I can't put on. This is why I preach the way I preach. This is why I'm vulnerable. It's not because I'm actually a vulnerable person. It's because I got to lay aside the weight that prevents the gospel from being heard by you. And so if you have walls up, then I'm going to take the walls down by removing my walls for you. This is what it looks like to lay down weight. You're too busy trying to hang on to your facade, hang on to your resume, hang on to the perception, and it's heavy. It's breaking you. Aren't you tired of being what you're not? Trying to assimilate to a culture that is man-made instead of just living for the unshakable kingdom? And think about a man-made culture. The target moves. It moves. One moment you're in the right, the next moment you're in the wrong. This is politically correct. That is. The target moves and you don't know when you're right and when you're wrong. Stop trying to please everybody else and just run your race to please God. Right? So that's our challenge. Our challenge is is to mimic the movements of the martyrs of of Hebrews 11. 
which means you got to go read your Bible, which means you got to get familiar with these stories, which means you got to understand how they ran so you can mimic them move for move. You can't be out there talking about, well, I don't understand how they were able to put it. Go read. Go, go read. And not, you ain't got to have no degree to read the Bible. It's plain. And, it, and if you don't understand it, this is what we're here for. This is exactly what I would love to sit down for four hours with you in the Bible. You might only give me one, but I would love four. I'll give me four. Next up, it says fixing our eyes on Jesus. So we have our challenge. Now we have our choice. See, we have a choice to maintain the mindset in the moments. It says that you fix your eyes on Jesus. Now, Jesus can't be seen, right? Right? So this is a mindset. You are literally setting your mind in the heavenlies above. You are setting your mind on Christ. You are fixing your eyes on something. Anybody ever done ballet? Anybody ever ballet? Ballet? You ain't got to be ashamed. Yeah. Oh, Jason done ballet. Oh, I can't wait to get to. Oh, yes. So I can say this comfortably now. When I was in high school, I was in show choir, okay? Did a little, yeah. And then I was also, um, I did... Um, Bye bye birdie, bye bye birdie. I was Albert Peterson, so there's this little thing where I had to do a little bit of ballet in my thing, right? I'm no good at it, but I had to do it. And so I learned from the the girl I was with that was helping me with the ballet stuff that they do it. I was like, how do you spin around without getting dizzy, right? Like when I spin around, I get dizzy. And they called it. She said it's called spotting, where like you look at a fixed mark on the wall or like a fixed point, and when you when you turn, you whip your head around like that. You see that? Like, like you look and you, and you whip your head around. Like that's, that's called spotting, right? Y'all like that? Do it again. One more time. One more. Mm, bam, right? Like, hey, I got it, right? But, but check this out. Like, like, all jokes aside, the world, as you're running this race, people are going to die. It's going to spin you around. You're going you're gonna to lose your job. And it's going to spin you around. You might lose a child. It's going to spin you around. How, how do you keep running the race if your eyes was fixed on everything else but Jesus, the one thing that doesn't move? See, you have to maintain the mindset in the moments. And look at this. Those aren't just the low moments. I named some low moments, but even in the high moments. Because what happens is if you are blessed by the one who is the blesser, and you take your eyes off the blesser to put it on the blessing, that blessing is going to go away. It's going to fail you. It's going to let you down. And when it does, you lose your foundation again. So the Bible says, fix your eyes on Jesus. Not take the good weight, put it down, and keep it in your peripheral to make sure it's still there. No, 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 no. Take the weight, put it down. Take the sin, put it down. Let it be, and fix your eyes on Jesus, Jesus, think about that, because I'm asking you right now, we can't amen and hallelujah in this service and then walk out of here with our eyes fixed on something else. See, amen means you agree with me. If you agree with me, then ask yourself in this moment, what are your eyes actually fixed on? I'm not talking Jesus and my lifestyle, Jesus and my comfort. It's Jesus or nothing, which means you're willing to let go of everything for him. But see, this is when we find out what you believe. This is when we find out what you believe because your belief is going to birth a behavior. Your belief, what you actually believe in, is going to show in how you actually live, not what you say with your lips. So think about this. It says, now, now, faith is the assurance of hope. See, there's a difference between worldly hope and the hope that's in the word. See, uh, Eric, Eric Maitland, our, our worship leader, a short guy to be up here doing his thing, right? <laughs> Eric, he says I can say that, I think. Anyway, <laughs> so look at this. Eric was supposed to, he, he texted me last night. He's like, man, I saw you having some voice issues. I'm going to bring you some throat coat. I was like, all right, throat coat is like a T for your throat, and he's a singer, so I'm like, surely he knows the antidote and the solution and all that. He's like, my wife has pulled it out for me. I got it. I'll have it in the morning. So I was hoping that Eric would have my throat coat when I got here. I got here, no throat coat. <laughs> I hoped and wished <laughs> that Eric would have it, but he didn't have it. And that's the worldly hope. You just don't know. 
If you are fixing your eyes on anything else that's not Jesus, you just don't know. Now, the hope of the word is a guaranteed expectation. See, that's why we say it was written. That's why I preach the Bible and not me. I got to preach something that doesn't move. The word doesn't move. It doesn't change. Jesus hasn't changed. The victory is still his, right? And so I fix my eyes on him who is sitting down, meaning it's finished. It's over. It's done. And that's a choice I have to make no matter the ups or the downs. It's a fixed thing. What are you looking at? What are you looking at? And, and I mean this because because everything else, I'm going to let you, if you're looking at me, I'm going to let you down. I'm telling you right now. I will fail you. Ask my wife. Ask my daughter. Ask my mama. Ask the people that work with me. I will fail you. If you're looking at Josh, he will fail you. If you're looking at the church, they will fail you. And this is why people hop in and out of churches because they're upset because preferences have moved and songs have changed and the preaching hasn't, isn't as good as it was. In front. What were you fixing your eyes on when you came here? You, we can't be upset on how good of the sermon was. This, it's the same word. I, I can't stand when people look at me and like, I love when you preach. Why? Wow, I'm preaching the same thing anybody else is preaching. As long as they're preaching from the Bible. But see, if you get caught up in in my style of preaching, then what happens when my style changes? All of a sudden, you can't receive the word again? You weren't looking at the right thing. You was looking at me. You weren't looking at Jesus. Fix your eyes on the word, right? On Jesus, the Lagos. That's, that's the challenge leading to the choice. And finally, our champion. Our champion. See, you got to magnify the Messiah in the mess. You got to magnify the Messiah in the mess. So, so here's the thing. It, it, says in, it says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, verse 2, the author and perfecter of our faith. That means he created, he's the line leader, he's the beginning and the end of faith, right? He's the author and the perfecter. Look at this, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. That means Jesus had his own race and there was a cross. How did he run his race? He looked past the cross at the joy that was set before him, sitting at the right hand of the Father with you. Think about this. Think about this. Mitch, he looked right at you. And he, he had a cross in front of him that he had to bear. The pain, the agony, all the things that come with the, pro, the, the cross. And he looked past it and saw sitting with you in eternity and said it was worth it. And that's not just a, all of it. No, think about it individually. Think about it individually. Your champion, your champion looked at his battle, looked at his cross, looked at his race, all the shame, all the agony, all the things that came with it, and he looked past it and fixed his eyes on eternity with you. And then he looks at you and says, will you not fix your eyes on me when the crosses are set before you, when the battles are in front of you, when the obstacles are in front of you? Can you not look past them, endure them, and see eternity with me? Some of you don't even believe heaven is heaven just because Jesus is there. And so you're paralyzed because when you look and all you see is Jesus, some of you don't believe that's enough. But that is heaven, the presence of Jesus for eternity. That's what heaven is. So what are your eyes fixed on? Who is your champion? What are you standing on? Is it unshakable? Because I promise you, anything other than Jesus can be shook. Not only that, later on in this chapter, go read it for yourself. Later on in this chapter, the Bible says, because he loves you so much, he will shake your world on purpose so that the things that can be shook no longer remain, and the only thing that can't be shook remains. If you fix your eyes on Jesus, you won't see it as punishment, but as a privilege that he loves you so much that he will shake your world up so that you lose all the things that you're standing on that aren't him, to show you that he's the only thing to stand on. 
How does that make you feel? How does that challenge you this morning? Are you in an unshakable kingdom? Or is your kingdom based on the comfort of life that you have right now, and if that comfort was taken from you, you no longer want anything to do with Jesus? Hmm? If you have these expectations of what your children are going to turn out like and they don't, is Jesus still good enough? Hmm? We, 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 we go around and we, we play the AAU game, right? Like my daughter was in basketball, and at some point I had to make a decision. I was her coach, but I was also called to be a pastor. I couldn't coach and pastor. It just didn't work because we had a smaller church. We didn't have no help. And so I had to figure out what I was going to fix my eyes on, my, my daughter's potential to be NBA star or Jesus and what he's called me to, knowing that he'll take care of the rest. See, some of us don't trust Jesus to take care of the rest or at least to take care of the rest the way we want him to. What are your eyes actually fixed on? Because this is how the enemy is going to shake you. He's going to look at what you're looking at. And he's going to destroy it because he knows that your joy is in that. What he doesn't know is that that's actually doing God a favor because then you're humbled. And all these things that you put all your hope in are gone. And the only thing left standing there is Jesus, our champion. Our champion. Do you know this Jesus? See, you can't make the choice to set your mind on Jesus if you don't know who he is. Do you know this Jesus? Our champion, we're about to sing this song called Champion, right? And you got to understand the lyrics, how the lyrics hit at home. He says, <coughs> excuse me. He says, I've tried so hard to see it. To see what? To see this victory. I tried so hard to see him sitting there. I tried so hard to fix my eyes on it. It took me so long to believe it. Believe what? That the victory is over. I tried so hard to see it. It took me so long to believe it. Believe what? That he would use somebody like me to carry his victory. Anybody been watching the Olympics? Anybody been watching the Olympics? Check it out. What happens is USA wins and we cheer like we did it, but we didn't even qualify, right? I don't even know the rules to half of these sports, right? But because I belong to USA, when they win, I win. Amen? I belong to the kingdom. So when he won, I won. He chose somebody like me to carry his victory, right? Think, think about it like this. Me and my wife, we, we, we went to a cookout in our neighborhood. And, and, and they was like, bring a side. Now, my wife makes this corn salad. It is fire. It is the bomb.com and everything else, .cc.org. I don't care. It's the bomb, right? And so what happens is, I don't even know what it was at first. I just know it got corn in it. My mom, I mean, my wife whipped it up and makes the side, and then guess who gets to carry it over there? Me, right? So I carry it over there, get to inside the house, and I put it on the counter, and I step back in my, all, my, all my glory, right? Like, yeah. I already know it's the best side in the house, right? This corn salad, everywhere we go, is the first thing to get ate up. Jason, you had the corn salad. He was like, man, what is this, right? So I couldn't tell him what it was because I've never made it before, but I brought it over, right? So it's the same. I'm carrying the victory. I know how good this is, but I didn't make it. I didn't spend time in the kitchen, but I get to carry the victory. I get to sit it down and like, but then he says, who made it? And she gets all the glory, right? It's the same thing. You and I get the privilege to carry the victory of Jesus Christ. Think about that. You, like, look at yourself. Please just look at yourself. I look at me. I say this every time because there's new people. I am the alcoholic. I am the adulterer. I am the one who couldn't turn off the porn. That is me. That is me. And he has me on this stage in front of you in Hamilton County carrying his victory. That is my champion. That is my champion. And so this is what happens. This is what happens. The, the words say, when I lift my voice and shout, every wall comes crashing down. Every wall comes crashing down. Why? Because I have the authority that Jesus gave me. Look at this. Look at this. This isn't no prosperity gospel. We don't teach that here. We don't do prosperity gospel. So what I'm saying is, though the obstacle may still be in front of me, Though the problems may still be real, I still, I still struggle with anxiety. I struggle with depression. I struggle with all these mental things, and then I have to speak to that. 
and say, but you've been defeated, anxiety. You've been defeated, depression. When I open up my mouth, when I lift my voice and shout, I speak these things that make depression fall down. It makes anxiety fall down because I have the authority that he gave to me that he's sitting on the, he's sitting on the seat. Saying that he's already defeated the worst thing this world can do to me. What's the worst thing this world can do to me? Kill me. And he conquered the grave. That is my champion. So I, I know my challenge now. My challenge is to mimic the movements I've seen in the Bible or that I've seen in you. When my grandfather passed away, to mimic that movement, I'm not worried if he's looking at me. I looked at him so I can walk like he walked. I can walk like Jesus walked. I can walk like people in the Bible walked, mimicking that movement. But then I got to make a choice that in the ups and the downs, I keep my eyes focused on who? My champion. My champion who's already won the battle, who's already secured the victory. We're not walking for a victory, we're walking from the victory. So what are you going to do with that? Some of you in this room right now think that you're not enough to carry the victory. You, you think of all the, you, you, you know what sin is, you know what a trespass is, and you're like, Rashad, I just, I, I, I can't get right, man. I continue to fail. Maybe you've asked him into your heart and all, and you're still failing. You're like, well, maybe it wasn't real. I'm, listen to me, y'all. Your victory was never based on you. It was based on your champion. You couldn't earn it. You could never be perfect enough in your deeds, in your words, in your thoughts. You cannot earn it. You live in a society that wants you to pick yourself up and earn it yourself that doesn't work in the unshakable kingdom. Because what happens when you're not perfect? Then you're shook. So my salvation is not based on my perfection. I am the biggest fraud in this building. If you look at me and you think something's great about me, you're looking at a fraud. The only reason I can stand up here and carry his victory is because he allows me to. And because I believe it. So what I'm asking you to do is I'm asking you to believe that. Not me, not the antics, not the slides, not the work. I'm asking you to believe in Jesus, that he looked past his cross and he died to secure your victory in him. In him. And said that you can carry the victory. He chose someone like you. He chose someone like you. He chose you. He chose you to carry the victory. It's the gospel message of telling them that there's nothing this world can do to you. Everything else can be shook. This world is going to fail you. I promise you. I promise you this world is going to fail you. Your wife will fail you. Your husband will fail you. Your children, this church, me, all your household stuff, all, your, all of it's going to, your job's going to fail you. Everything's going to fail you. So why would you fix yourself on that? Why not fix yourself on Jesus and let people have the benefit of you not wavering? Because you know where the promise is at. And now you can love without conditions. Now you can love without expectations. Now you can move forward without being afraid of being hurt because you were never expecting them to be perfect. You expected him to be perfect and he finished it. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, I thank you. Father, I thank you for our champion, Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you that you have secured the victory in him. I, I, Father, I'm so thankful that has nothing to do with me. And I lift my voice, the little voice I have, I lift it and shout, willing to lose it because he's so worthy. I ask that those who are in this room who don't know your son, Father, that they see this is not a gimmick. There's no antics to this, that we just surrender. We just lay down every weight and every sin and fix our eyes on our champion, Jesus. And those that are in this room who believe that, Father, may they make practical advancements today to live that out in a way that the world can see, can see the champion that is worth it through us. It's in Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen.